Welcome to the first week of moving our sermons online. We continue today with our Sermon on the Mount series, and we start in Matthew chapter 7, and we're in verses 1 to 6. And so let me start off our time together by reading for you. These are the words of Jesus, beginning in verse 1. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And so here we have three parts to this teaching of Christ. And the first is a warning. It's a warning to Christian believers, to followers of Jesus Christ, and it's a warning of an internal threat that exists in our walk and in our faith. It's an internal threat that can, that can come up uh, because of our sinful nature and that can uh, come up if we choose to follow after it. And the second is a call. How are we to live as Christians? So we have a warning and then we have a call. And then the th- third part is that we have another warning and this is a, another warning of external threats that are there. And so we're going to look at all three parts today and let's start off our time. Let's just pray together. Father, as we look into your word, we just acknowledge that this is a a bit different setup from what we're used to, but we ask you to use it. And we welcome, as we always do, we welcome your spirit, the counselor, to come and to give us thoughts and ideas of how to live this out as we dig into your word. And so we welcome your presence and we, we just welcome you to lead us. Amen. So this first, first part Verses 1 and 2, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. What is meant by judged here? Because judge can mean a lot of things. It can mean, in our culture, it can mean you just think you're better than I am. Who are you to judge me? It can mean uh, to to judge like a judicial judge does, where they they pass down a a ruling on a piece of our, our law that we have. It can be judge, as in you're judging a contest and how someone did. And so what is the meaning of judge here? Well, in the original language, it is a pronouncement of guilt. And not quite a judicial way, but a pronouncement of guilt in the idea that you are determining someone's fate, the absolute determination of someone's fate. So judging here means writing people off. It means withholding forgiveness from them. Uh, it means living without mercy towards someone, judging someone. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna show you mercy. You don't deserve mercy, and it's making no room in life uh, for the f- faults of other people that are around us. Excuse me. And so there are connections back into the Sermon on the Mount. Here we see a connection back to chapter five, verse seven in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. And in 6.12, we have the Lord's Prayer, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And so this concept that, that's being, that we're being led to here is that we want to have the same type of forgiving attitude and demeanor and merciful attitude and demeanor that God had for us. And that brings power to our life. And to illustrate this, I want to share with you a short clip from our Alpha series. And this is, this is the voice of Corey Ten Boom. And she has met one of, she was a survivor of the Holocaust. And, and after the war is over, later in her life, she has one of the former guards of her camp that she was in approaches her and ask her for forgiveness for what he did to her and to her family. And I want you to to listen to her response and what her source 
of ability to forgive on that scale is. Bill, you forgive me. And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who has given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. But he can. But he can. So this brings up a really big question. What causes people, what causes us to be unforgiving? Well, I think there's an initial answer to that that has two big highlights for us. And this, this is the answer. Some have never known about or fully received God's love and personal forgiveness. And because they've never received it, they've never experienced it, they don't have the ability to share that love and forgiveness to others. And so the two important highlights for us are, well, one, there's the importance of telling people about the forgiveness that's available to them through Jesus Christ. About telling people about that because that will impact the world in a tremendous way if they then experience that and begin to reflect it and give it to others in the world. And, and part two is a really the second highlight is a, is a really personal one to you and I. And that's to ask us this introspective question. To ask ourselves this introspective question. Is there any mistake that I've made in life that I have not been willing to receive God's forgiveness for? And here's a reality that some of us can face is that there's some things that we've done that we're not willing to forgive ourselves for, and we don't think God can forgive us for them either. And that's holding us back from then sharing mercy and forgiveness to other people. And so we need to dig into that. We need to face that, that God is willing to forgive us for something that we might not initially be willing to forgive ourselves for. And so this, this source of being able, how do we come into these situations? How do we approach a world that we get hurt by and yet have the power and the ability as Christians to forgive others? Well, it comes from this, the heartfelt gratitude of a Christian towards God for what he has done in their lives is the very source of that Christian's ability to forgive others because he's done so much for us. And we think about what we have been forgiven for, we can then turn around and use that, just as Corey Ten Boom is, did, as a source to be forgiving others. And there's a warning here, there's a warning in this passage for us that if you or I, if we think we're a Christian, but we don't show mercy to others in this life, we will be judged, we will be pronounced guilty by God because we have not shown mercy in this life. And this gives us an action point. Our life now, this is a window of opportunity that we all have to show mercy. Tapping into the deep well of God's mercy, of God's forgiveness, and tapping to that deep well that becomes gratitude in our mindset. As Christians, you and I, we're supposed to be like a faucet that pours out water, but instead of pouring out water, we're pouring out God's mercy and kindness into a world that's full of people who make mistakes, including you and I. And I, I love Corey's words. I felt God's love stream through my arms in that moment 
where she decided to forgive, in that moment where she tapped into that deep well of gratitude towards God. And that's who we want to be as Christians in a broken and a fallen world. The second piece to this passage is a call to us as Christians and how to live. Let me read for us from verse 3 to 5. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is definitely a a carpenter's metaphor. Jesus, who was uh, the son of a carpenter. And so we have this this image of the the sawdust, the the speck of sawdust, and we have the image of of the log. And he's using hyperbole again in the Sermon on the Mount, where he's, uh, he's... He's using this this statement that it's an exaggerated statement. You can't have a log in your own eye. We all know that. But it's an exaggerated statement to make a point and give emphasis to what he's saying. And so this speck that he talks about, the speck of sawdust, well, this is an issue of no major consequence that the accuser is bringing up in someone else's life. And it's of no major consequence according to God, because it's Jesus that's saying that this issue is small. And so it's not a major consequence, and yet the accuser is condemning, is condemning in what they're saying. And so this is a a warning to to the accuser about about finding something of of no major consequence in in someone else's life. Well, there's a, a log in your own. So the log is this current issue of major concern in God's eyes in the accuser's life. And so we need, there's a deliberate contrast there of an issue of no major consequence and an issue of major consequence. And then we have this word hypocrite that comes up again. And it's going to ring a bell for you because it's been brought up several other times already in the Sermon on the Mount. If you look back in your Bibles in 6.2, with giving... So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. And we see in 6.5 with prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and standing in the street corners to be seen by others. And in 6.16, again, fasting. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. And so hypocrite, those who are trying to use good works as a mask to cover, to cover over major areas of unaddressed sin. And so the, the use of good works is addressed in those earlier passages and what God wants us to be motivated by when we do good works. But here, he's saying this, he's speaking to this reality. Good works can't be used as a mask to cover over unaddressed sin in the lives of Christians. Now, most world religions, good works can do this. They serve that function. Uh, Good works are are done in in many of the places that I have served and lived in uh, for the purpose of making up for the evil that a person does in their life. They they know that they acknowledge they have sin in their life, and so especially... Uh, seniors or, or the elderly will, if they know they're in their, uh, their the last days of, of, or last years of their life, they'll make a, a rush to, to do some major good works to deal with that evil that they might have done previously in their life. So motivation in other world religions and motivation that's just common to, to people is to do good works to make up for the evil uh, that's been done. And uh, another motivator is, is in doing its works, it's done so that you will get from God what you ask for. If you do a good work, well, then God will look at you favorably or more favorably, and then maybe what you're asking for, he'll actually grant it. So that's a, in other world religions, uh, that's another good reason to do good works. And finally, just the, the common human factor of doing good works are the motivation that, hey, you'll get some praise from people around you. 
look at that, that guy, or look at that girl. Isn't it amazing that the good that he does, or how he sacrifices, or how she sacrifices, or helps out? And so there's this, this selfish motivation just, just to get praised by it. And so Jesus is calling you and I, as Christians, to be different. To be different. And it's, it's a big call. But it's a call that we can realistically carry out. Because, first of all, our sin has already been forgiven through the work of Christ. And so he's speaking ahead here to the reality that you and I would live in. We don't have to make up for the evil that we've done because we have already been granted that forgiveness by God through not our works, but by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So we're, we're free from being motivated by that, uh, motivated by that desire to make up for sin. We don't have to panic and try and make up. Uh, we can rest in, in the guarantee, the assuredness that we have that we have already received that forgiveness. And so we've already been forgiven through Jesus Christ, and he wants us as Christians to also realize that because of Jesus, we have a loving Heavenly Father, if we remember earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer, who promises to provide for what we will need in this life. So we don't have to go to God showing him this good work that we did, we've done and then create a formula for asking for more things in our life. We know we have a Father that is going to provide for us for what we need. We do good works as Christians, again, out of that gratitude to God for what he has already done. We're supposed to do good works. We're called to do good works. But how we go about it is very important. What motivates us is very important. And so how do we, how do, we do this? How do we do good works without being hypocrites? Well, we'll get to that. But there is a clear calling to do good works in Scripture and they're of tremendous benefit. So I don't want us to get the idea caught up that we're, we're supposed to avoid doing good works for some reason. No, good works are good to do, but they're to be done with a humble heart. They're to be done when our inner world is right in God's eyes. And they're to be done, as we've talked about before, for the audience of one. We're to do our good works for our Father's view, okay, for, for His audience, and not for accolades or praise of other people. That's what motivates us. And so, how do we do our good works without being hypocrites? How do we come alongside someone, as this is the specific passage is addressing, who is sinning, and how do we help them onto the right course? Well, the answer that Jesus is showing us here is that we need to be maintaining healthy spiritual vision. And how do we do that? Well, we do that through regular self-examination. We maintain healthy spiritual vision through regular self-examination of sin in our own life. Now, there's many ways to do this, but my most regular way and probably longest lasting way of doing self-examination is by maintaining an area of confession in, uh, in my prayer journal that I keep. I've, I've shared that with, with you members before, that I, I have a prayer journal that has different sections. I pray for my my family, my, my work, some of the schooling that I do, just different areas of life and ministry uh, that I just track. And um, one area I have is just confession. And so when I, when I go to confession, well, I try to keep it pretty short as far as I'm not looking back over a year. I'm not looking back over a month. I'm trying to keep it short of I'm looking back as reg- regular enough that I can say, okay, in the last three days, four days, or in the last week, um, what do I need to take care of based on the last few days? How have I been doing? And so um, I take time out to think through different areas over the past few days or the past week. How have my interactions with my own family been? How have I been as a husband? How am I doing as a, as a dad? Were there any bad interactions there that I caused that I need to go back and step into, ask for forgiveness for, for my wife or for my kids? Uh, how about with my coworkers? How did I treat them this week? Was I stressed out and, and snapping at them? Was I impatient? Uh, and so I got to look at that and be honest if I can think back on a memory where, ooh, you know, I did something. I got to go, go make that right. How was I out in the world running errands, meeting up with people? Um, and what I find is that um, often sinful actions over those last three or four days will just come up right away. I'll, I'll be able to think of them. They're, they're not hard to... Uh, to bring up, and I'll, I'll ask 
I'll ask God through the counselor, through the His Holy Spirit, to bring to mind just any issues that I need to deal with. I'm going to trust that He's going to bring to mind in that moment of reflection. He's going to bring to mind what I need to step back into to make right. Where have I done wrong? And so sometimes it's actions I've done. Other times it's just maybe a lack of faith in one area. Um, maybe it's a truth that I'm not believing or a value of his that, that I'm, I'm not stepping into. And so, and, but probably most often it's an attitude of my own that I need to change. And so uh, the next question I ask is, okay, now that I've identified these things that I've, I've done, the sin that I've done, do I need to change how I'm thinking, how I'm speaking? Do I change how, my behavior in the situation? Uh, is there a pattern in my life where I'm repeatedly doing the same thing and I need to change that pattern? Do I need to apologize? And do I need to have a, a tough conversation maybe with someone where I say, hey, uh, what I said or what I, what I did, that was wrong. And I just need to ask you to, to forgive me for it. I'm, I'm going to try not to, to be that way or, or do that again. And so for me, this exercise, it, it comes to uh, the, the pinnacle is this great moment when I ask God for forgiveness, and what I get to do is I always write in my confession part of my, my, uh, my prayer journal. I always do that in pencil so I can have this great moment where once I've, I've confessed it to, to my Father who loves me and can forgive me in, in heaven, and once I've committed, maybe I've written down what I'm going to do or just made a mental note of what I'm going to do to make things right where he's led me to do that, there's this great moment where I flip the pencil around and out comes the eraser, and I erase all of those sins uh, that I've written down, reflected on. And hey, I've got a clean page both in my book and, and in life. And so the benefits of this self-reflection, the benefits of confession uh, through prayer or through a prayer journal is, one, the self-reflection is going to break patterns of sin in our lives. Um, it's going to interrupt sinful attitudes that we have so they don't just keep going on and on because a pattern, if it's left, it becomes, or sorry, if it just a, a, a sin is left to be repeated, it becomes a pattern in our life. And then it goes from being a pattern, if it's left long enough, it becomes part of who we are. It becomes part of our character, part of our personality. And so we want to interrupt those uh, patterns with this, this moment of reflection and asking for God's view on our life. Um, and I'm always amazed. Well, one, I'm, I'm just always amazed by how much I actually have. I, I can go into a, a prayer time thinking, oh, I've had a pretty good week. And then I get to the time of confession, I go, oh, oh, I have more than I, I thought I, I, I did coming into this time. Um, but I'm also, I'm also so glad because it transforms hearts and transforms minds. And, and by doing this self-examination, receiving God's forgiveness, there's an upwelling of gratitude for that forgiveness. And there's also an upwelling of empathy for uh, those who are struggling or those who have failed around you, or those who have made mistakes, those who have hurt me. I now have empathy for them because I've reflected, hey, I'm not perfect myself and I, and I need to be receiving forgiveness to move forward from God and from other people. And so there is a very big need that's being addressed here in that is for the Christian to remove self-righteousness from our lives. It needs total removal. Then we come into a place that we can speak into the life of another believer. And once we have genuinely dealt with the sin in our own life, then we can also begin speaking into each other's lives on the, the speck of sawdust that we have because uh, we're called to do that. We're called to walk with each other and, and, and talk about the things we, we see in each other's lives. And so the focal point is here. Have a world view lens. How you see the world, picture glasses uh, that you have on. Have eyes of humility or have lenses of humility, how you see the world and humbleness. Just admitting that you're, you're one of the many people that make mistakes and uh, you don't want to have eyes of self-righteousness as you look out onto the world. This brings us to part three of our text this morning. Part three is another warning, but so it's a warning of external dangers to believers. So it's a warning to us in living as Christians in what can be a hostile world towards us. And so verse six brings up this illustration. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearl to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. These are not pets that are being referring to. There's a big 
gap between how the ancient audience heard and understood this teaching and how you and I as a modern audience hear this teaching today. And it comes down to our view on these two animals. And so we need to bridge that gap. And I, I want to bridge that gap by just sharing with you a story. I grew up with dogs and I, and I love dogs. I loved having dogs. But the idea behind using a dog as an illustration in this piece of the Sermon on the Mount is not to instill a sense of companionship or instill a, a sense of friendship. It's one of violence. It's one of hostility. It's one of a sense of fear. And to give you an idea of, to help you bridge that gap between the ancient audience and us today, I just want to tell you two stories that will give those, hopefully give those same feelings to you and I today as what the ancient audience would have felt in hearing this. So when I worked in Asia, I loved to go out running in the foothills that were outside our town. And in these foothills, foothills this was prime pasture for flocks of sheep and goats. And so I'd go out running and they're just this beautiful picturesque valley systems with hundreds of sheep and goats up on the hills with shepherds and helping the shepherds to guard these sheep and goats are Central Asian shepherd dogs. And these dogs are big and these dogs are mean and they're meant to be mean because they have a job to do. There are wolves, wolves and wolf packs that come down from the mountains and will just tear apart sheep and goats and tear into the flock if they're not protected. But these shepherd dogs are bred so that they can take on wolves when they need to. They're big and they're mean and they can be dangerous. And so when I would go on these runs, uh, I would come across these flocks and then come across these dogs. And usually these dogs would just come up to me. They would, they would chase me off. They would just let me know that they mean business and I'd better stay away from their sheep. And I would. I'd just give them a wide berth and that's what they wanted. And then they'd go back to their, their flock. And they were so uh, almost wild that shepherds couldn't actually just call them over. If the dog wanted to go after you, the shepherd couldn't get in the way just by calling for the dog. The, the dog had to make the decision that you weren't a threat anymore. And so on one of these runs, I was headed out into uh, a, a valley not too, not too far from our town. And uh, I went out and there was one of these flocks that was up on the, the hill beside, uh, beside the town or up on the hills. And I had three of these shepherd dogs come at me. And, uh, and so I did what I always do. I gave them a wide berth. Two of them turned around. But the third dog, the biggest, meanest dog of the bunch, wouldn't turn around. He started coming after me. And when he comes after me, he, he came and he was, I could tell right away, he just wanted to bite into me. He wanted to tear into me. And so in Central Asia, if you have a dog that comes at you, usually the language that you speak is you pretend to throw a rock. If you pretend to throw a rock, the dog will turn around. It'll say, it'll see that you, you can communicate, hey, I can mean business too. And so I did that, pretend to throw a rock. This dog didn't even flinch. He kept chasing me. And I, I went way off the trail. I started climbing over, scrambling over hills. And what would happen is he would, he would come up to me and try and get in and, and bite me, bite my legs, and have to turn, turn around on him. And, and then he would back off a few meters and just bark and bark and, and bare his teeth at me. And so this dog kept coming at me. He kept stalking me. I went over hills. I, I jumped over uh, three, four, four foot uh, drops to try and get away from him. And, and I even picked up some small rocks, started hitting them with those, and he just kept pursuing me. And so I looked, I looked after the run and this dog had chased me for almost two kilometers where he stalked me. And so eventually I had to just take care of him. But the point of my story is this, working dogs that I experienced in Asia had the same level of danger to them as what our ancient audience would be thinking of when they think of dogs and when they think of dog packs. They were a danger. They were a risk to uh, children as well. If you came across uh, wild animals or, or wild dogs, they could be, be a danger uh, to kids as well. So dogs are supposed to instill a feeling of fear, of violence, of, of danger, and um, and we're supposed to take that sense and look into verse 6 with that, with that same sense. Now pigs, pigs were looked on with a type of disdain or disgust in that time. They were the ultimate unclean animal for a Jewish audience. And so I don't want to go into too big because you might be listening with your, your kids uh, to this, to this uh, sermon, but 
To give you the idea of disgust uh, that would have been felt towards pigs, you need to think of um, a criminal case in our, in our area in Vancouver where pigs were fed the remains of people. And in that feeling of disgust you get by, oh, I hope I, I never ate bacon that, that was made from those pigs. That same feeling of disgust you have, that's the disgust that our ancient audience would have had when they think of pigs and when they think of, um, of dogs as well. And so we want to take that back into the passage and look at it again. Do not give dogs what is sacred, these violent, vicious dogs. Do not throw your pearls, things of value, in front of pigs that are, are unclean, that have a sense of disgust. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. And pigs were known to feed on the remains of dead animals and dead people in ancient times. They were also known to even kill small children, and so there was a danger to them as well. And so, in order to get a more in-depth understanding, because this, this is one verse mentioning dogs and pigs, we need to look at some other areas of scripture that mention these animals and see how they're used. If we go into 2 Peter chapter 2, we can see that Peter is talking about dogs and pigs in reference to false teachers and the destruction that, that they can cause. Uh, to believers, to followers of Jesus. And so verse 22 says this right at the very end of the chapter, just before chapter 3 starts, of 2 Peter. Of them the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit, and a sow that is unwashed returns to her wallowing in the mud. And so Peter is using... The image of dogs and pigs to talk about those who have heard and understood the gospel, but then have chosen to pursue worldly pleasures over it. And people who do that can then become hostile not only to the gospel message in, in hearing in its right form, they can become hostile to the message itself, but they can come become hostile to those who are bringing that message. They become hostile to you and I as the messengers and even violent. And so this is Peter's use of dogs and pigs. Now, another place to look is over in the Psalms, the Psalm of David. If you turn over to Psalm 22, there's another reference that brings some better understanding, some more clarity to the use of these animals. So in Psalm 22, verse 16, we're going to see some very familiar scripture here. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircles me. Impending violence. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes. This is the familiar one. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. And of course, that brings back to mind the execution of Jesus on the cross and the, the callousness of the Roman soldiers who, amidst his suffering and his death, are dividing his clothes up uh, below him. And so with these two passages communicate to us, we cannot be naive to evil in the world as Christians. And if you want to look at another reference, I encourage you to look at uh, Luke 22. We don't have time to go into it today in this sermon, but if you want to look at Luke 22, 36 to 38, there's a contrast to when Jesus originally sends out the 12 earlier in Luke's gospel, and now he's telling them, go and be prepared to go out into a hostile world. And so what do we do? Well, as we go out and as we go about sharing the gospel, this ministry of evangelism, we need to make choices of how and when to share. How and when to share becomes really important. And the action we need to take is the, there is a, a call to act in discernment when we're sharing the gospel. How do we act on discernment? What does it look like? Well, one, I think we prepare ourselves to face rejection in the world as Christians. It's not always going to be easy for us. It's not always going to be easy for us to identify with Jesus Christ and the true gospel that he came to share and for us to live out. We need to prepare for that rejection. And some believers in some parts of the world are going to experience it much harder than others. But we need to prepare to experience rejection on some level. 
Two, I think there's a call here for toughness and a focus of attitude for us as Christians. We don't need the world's acceptance or accolades for what we do. We just go about doing it for that audience of one. And third, there's a call here for Christians to draw together. We're to be supporting one another amidst a hostile world. People on the outside of our worldview might not get it. And they might even be angry towards us or dismissive towards us. And so we need to draw together. We need to be actively supporting one another as Christians and as Christian communities. And this can be on a small scale in life groups. This can be larger scale, the, the bo- local body that, that you participate in worship at, the local church that you participate at. This can be wider. This can be churches on the conference level, or it can be multiple conferences coming together to do good things and support one another. And so there's a real push towards unity as well as believers amidst this. And so to review our time and in our sermon uh, together today, looking at Matthew 7 verses 1 to 6, well, there is a warning It's a warning warning about an internal threat to you and I as believers that we need to not be critical and condemning or allow those attitudes to drive out the love in our relationships, that love that has been shown to us by God, we're, we're to reflect it instead. There is a call for us. We have been called to self-examination and a removal of self-righteousness in our attitudes and our behavior. And finally, there's this warning. Let's not be naive of evil that's in the world. Let me close our time. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to be together. I just pray for my brothers and sisters as they gather amid COVID. Maybe they're listening as a family or maybe they're listening on their own. And, um, and maybe they, they are gathering online. Lord, I just ask that you would give your thoughts and ideas of reflection this morning. I ask that you would bless their conversation and their, their thinking going forward today. And Lord, we really want to live this out. We want to know how to, to navigate these warnings that you've given us. And we want, we want to reflect and we want to be that faucet of overflowing mercy and forgiveness into the world because you have forgiven us for much greater things. And so we thank you for that reality, Lord, and we we thank you that you are at work amidst this season. You are at work and you are powerful. And so we worship you this morning. Amen. I hope you have a terrific day, whether you're listening to this on Sunday. Keep looking at our website for weekly updates to not just the sermons, but also we're planning to get resources for kids ministry up there. And I'm sure there will be additional areas for additional ministries as we move forward and move more things online as we need to. God bless.